Hey everyone, welcome back to the other side of weight loss. I'm excited for my guest today because we are going to be talking about how to heal through food. And you think, oh yeah, Karen, I know we all know we have to heal through food, but now listen up. If you have been suffering with weight loss resistance, food is the ticket. And it's not just about you know, cutting your calories, counting your carbs, eating a paleo diet. There's more to it. And for a lot of women nowadays, it comes down to inflammation in the body that is causing them to not be able to lose weight. That is a huge piece of the weight loss resistance puzzle. And you can eat really, really healthy but for you, those healthy foods are causing inflammation and causing you weight problems. My guest today is Christina Kerb, and she is the freaking expert on this, you guys. She is a certified nutritional therapy practitioner and former restaurant chef. Her love of food, and particularly using real food to heal, birth her very popular food blog and wellness site, The Castaway Kitchen. She is the author of Made Whole Cookbook, which I have right here, of one of them. It's very, if you're not on, on the video, you can go on and look at it. It's such a beautiful cookbook, which we're going to get to. <laughs> She's the co-host of Kitchen Table Talks podcast. After hitting her own rock bottom with a number of mystery symptoms and a diagnosis of an autoimmune disorder, Christina took to the kitchen to find wellness. Using her kitchen prowess and love of research, she began to discover the connection between her symptoms and the food she ate. This ongoing experiment birthed her blog, which is a collection of inventive, allergen-friendly, low-carb, whole food recipes that have helped her reverse autoimmune disease, lose weight, and take control of her own health and well-being. So welcome, Christina. Thanks so much for having me. Yes. So you guys, Christina is so popular. You got to go check her out on Instagram. She's got like 100,000 followers. I thought I was doing really good at like 8,000. No, she's doing awesome. And for good reason. Your pictures are beautiful. Your food just is like, it's so inspiring to eat healthy when you see all your recipes and your book is gorgeous. I love this book. It's not just a recipe book, which I love. It's right. you really dive into so much about the effects of food on our body and how to heal. And oh, I think it's great. So let's start first with where you're, where you came from, because this is a very important piece that I think so many people can relate with. And it started when you many were, moons ago. Many, oh, so long ago. <laughs> oh, so, once upon a time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you know, it's interesting because now I've been doing what I do now for five years and um, yeah, people, I forget that people don't know that this girl grew up in Miami. Uh, so I'm Cuban, uh, first generation American. And I grew up kind of eating like my mom cooked from scratch and stuff. Right. But it was a lot of like whole wheat pasta. We ate a lot of, you know, Cuban food, beans, rice, pork. And then I definitely had those, like, you know, we had junk food too, like frosted flakes and, you know, ice cream and stuff. And I, I, I mean, I was overweight from, day one. I mean, there's baby pictures and I'm bigger than my little sister. I, I mean, at a year old, I was bigger than my two-year-old sister. Um, and my mom was like, yeah, I used to just, you love your formula with the cereal in it and just drink, you know, like you never suck your thumb, you just bottles to the face. And I'm like, thanks mom. Um, and so yeah, I just grew up always overweight and, you know, like finished my food and my sister's and I was sick a lot as a kid. Ever, I was hospitalized with with pneumonia eight months old, and then literally mm -hmm. from then on, at least twice a year, I was on antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Even I was in throat infection, strep throat, chronic constipation. I mean, when you look back now, we're like, "Hello, all these red flags," <laughs> but yeah. we didn't know. And so that was my childhood, like just a lot of sickness, um, and you know, a lot of health issues. And then I, you know, as a teenager, and I was still overweight, and I had tried every diet. I mean. And my mom, bless her heart, um, she didn't know better. Like my mom, um, my mom with like, she was always like thin, but with every pregnancy would like gain weight and then like do these crazy crash diets and lose like 60 pounds in three months. Um, and so she yo-yoed a lot over the years and we did the diets together and we did like South Beach diet together and we'd go to the weigh-ins at the Weight Watchers Clinic together. And, um, you know, she would see results. And I remember in middle school, my older sister and my mom were sharing clothes. They were both a size two and a four. And I was like in a size like 14 or 12, wow, yeah. which is like what I'm wearing now. But like as a middle schooler, 
like I felt enormous, you know, now that I got, went all the way up to size 22. I mean, I was like 275 pounds at my wow. biggest. Um, so now at a size 12 with like a lot of muscle mass, I feel pretty good, you know? Yeah. You look but amazing. Back, thank you. But back then I was traumatized as hell. And so that led to, you know, horrible decisions. I think I started drinking and like dabbling in drugs, like smoking weed and stuff with my friends at like 14. Um, and that progressed for like a decade and, and definitely got worse <laughs> as I got older and started, you know, the Miami club scene and all that. So I did some pretty, I mean, like not, I didn't do like heroin, but I did like, you know, cocaine and ecstasy and other more serious yep. drugs. Um, yeah. And I mean, I can't imagine that my body, I don't know how I didn't shut down at that point because I was going to school full time. I worked full time. So like during the daytime hours, I was like a normally functioning human, but in the nighttime, but then I was also up all night doing horrible things. And then during the day I was like taking diet pills. Like I don't even know what was in them and they were red and scary looking. So probably like, (laughs) probably like crack, like fentanyl. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I try and like not eat. And so then I would like not eat and drink coffee all day and need a salad for lunch. And then like, go partying at night and then at three in the morning end up at Denny's eating like chili cheese fries and anything I could get my hands on because I was famished. And this was just so much of my life. And oh, and on top of all that, at 13, I, I was, I manifested an autoimmune uh, condition, which no one told me it was autoimmune back then. Doctors just told me that I needed to lose weight and be cleaner. So they essentially told me like, you're fat and you're dirty and that's why you have boils on your skin. And I'm like, thanks guys. Wow. Now I also need therapy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I had hydrogenitis superativa, and it's an auto-inflammatory autoimmune skin condition. And it's gruesome because it affects, you know, inner thighs, underarms, anywhere where there's a concentration of lymph nodes. Um, it, I mean, some people get it, like, some people even get it, like, on their back or their, or their scalp, but usually it's, like, inner thigh groin area, and even, like, on your butt. And so, you know, it's essentially around your private parts. And people are like, what the hell? And you're like, is this an STD? What is happening? It's painful. It's embarrassing. You don't want to like talk about it. So so your love life was great, I'm sure, right? Well, the thing is, is <laughs> I mean, surprisingly, and this was part of like the bad things is that I actually, I was very sexually active, but I just could not do it sober because it was right. like, I need, to be, I need to be in a dark room and I need to be drunk. Yeah, right. to do this. <laughs> um, but later on when I started my blog and, um, you know, put my skin condition in remission and I came out essentially about it, like wrote a blog post, like, this is what I'm dealing with. This is why I changed my life. I had ex-boyfriends calling me up. I mean, I've been married now for like 10 years, but I mean, like, I had no idea. And I'm like, I know. I'm like, that's how messed up it was. It was literally a full-time job hiding this from people. Wow. Um, Yeah. Especially going from Miami where people are like half naked. Yes, totally. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was, gosh, I really came from like, when you think of worst case scenario, (laughs) That's me. That's me. I mean, the antibiotic use, drug use, alcohol use. I mean, like, just, I mean, like right from the get go, you just on the wrong path. Not catch a break. Yeah. No. Did autoimmune conditions run in your family? They do. I was going to say, Which we didn't know, but of course, now we know my mom has Hashimoto's. My dad has multiple sclerosis. Like, yeah. and it's crazy because I knew this since he was, I didn't even know MS was was an autoimmune disease. I mean, this was when I was in middle school, you know, he told me that. And um, yeah, it's wild. Cause now we started connecting the dots and I'm like, Oh my God. It's crazy how our parents just had no clue though about that. No clue. No one would have thought her gut's leaky and we've been giving her antibiotics nonstop. Like we do with our kids, right? Like we right. would never do that now knowing what we know, but them, it's just like throw them on antibiotics a couple times a year thinking everything's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. And wham, like your body was, yeah. came out of the womb already compromised. Absolutely. Like flip yeah. all those genes on, right? Flip all the genes on. And I got all of them. I mean, I have two sisters and they've been um, spared, <laughs> spared the epigenetics, but I definitely, I caught all the breaks and it was, um, yeah, it was really hard. And, you know, I, I had so many failed attempts, Karen, like failed attempts at weight loss, failed attempts at eating healthy, saw a gazillion doctors. And then, then even in like my twenties, my family made this like shift into like more holistic stuff. My mom opened this farm to table restaurant and started, we started getting, you know, getting to know all these like holistic practitioners. So I started seeing like Chinese medicine doctors, functional medicine doctors, integrative medicine doctors. But again, even then this is 2005, 2006, 2008, they weren't a hundred percent on gut. So I did paleo back then, but no one, you know, um, but still, and I, I mean, and that helped a little bit. Um, I lost some weight with that, but of course 
lifestyle stuff was still a mess. Oh my God, I was smoking cigarettes. Oh yeah, to top it all off, I smoked cigarettes too, guys. Can't forget that one. Christina, you and I would have been really good friends back in our 20s, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> all of that, I did all of those things. And the yeah. same thing was just like super self-destructive on myself for so many years that that, don't you feel like that was a huge part of the healing process to, oh, yeah. to suddenly realize that you got to respect your body? Yes, because what I realized is that all those years, so much self-harm because it was like this, perpe- this cycle of like, I would go out and binge drink and smoke and do drugs. And then I feel like a horrible person. And then I'd like binge eat almost as like a self punishment. But then I purge because I was like, Oh my God, because, but I I don't want to like be fat anymore. And I was miserable because I had horrible body image issues. And yeah, it was a really bad cycle. But I, one of the things I learned through my healing journey is that um, a lot of the failures I had early on and these like kind of false attempts at trying to get healthy were, they were coming from a place of self-loathing. Yeah. And it, it, it wasn't until I really realized that like, I deserve, like I'm a good person who made mistakes, but I am a good person and I deserve to be healthy. And I forgive myself for all the dumb things I did. And I, and I'm, I want to be better. I deserve to be better. And when I started to truly love my body and take care of myself and like, I think like when you say, when I say love my body, like I, I don't, I know people are like, oh my God, like it's hard to look in the mirror and see. I have scars. I mean, my skin condition left very visible, dark. They're not like, I'll never look at them and be like, I love these scars. It's not going to (laughs) happen. But there's a neutrality there where I'm like, it's just part of who I am, but I still love this body and I want to feel good because it's the one who carries me through life. Yeah. And that's really where these lifestyle changes that I implemented, that's when they took hold. Because I always thought early on, even in my first three whole thirties or my first six months of autoimmune paleo, I thought I was going to heal and go back to go back. Right. my life. I'd be, i magic heal, da, 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 like Cinderella moment and be able to go back to this, that life that I had before, which right at that point I was already a mom. So I wasn't like farting, but you know, wine and beer on the weekends and pizza and whatever. And like, just more, I thought it'd be like, we'd be like the fun party house. No, <laughs> we are the opposite. We go to sleep at nine o'clock at night and like, yeah, partying. And Did is, things like, going get on a worse hike. after pregnancy? Oh, yes. Yeah. Because you talk about kind of the two year after postpartum being kind of your breaking point. Yeah. It got so much worse. And it got worse to the point where my skin condition that had affected my inner thighs and my underarms started manifesting under my breasts. Mm. And while I'm nursing this baby. Mm. And also, I was like, man, no, you can't take my boobs. (laughs) I'm like... (laughs) I like my boobs. I don't want to have this like painful thing on them and it leaves a scar. And I was like, so like pissed. Yeah. I was like, no, don't I mean, touch never... the one thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I need, I wanted to like oh, part of my body that where I could feel sexy and that was like mine and like, oh, and I was just weaning this baby. And so I was just like, hell, I just knew. Um, yeah. And I just, and I mean, we had taken these family pictures before we left San Diego because we're military. So we move every three years. So we had left San Diego. We had just gotten stationed in Hawaii. And I remember a girlfriend of mine, a really good friend of mine took the family photos. And, um, when I got them back home, my God, I mean, my hair was on point. My makeup looked great, but I could not recognize my body. Yeah. I just did it. And I was always a bigger girl. Even those party years where I kind of like, you know, I did some crazy diet. So I yo-yoed, but like, I was always like, I had like in many ways, embraced my curves and still felt sexy in a lot of ways but after those two years postpartum I like realized I hadn't looked at myself in the mirror like I hadn't stopped to look at myself in the mirror I had been like the mom blob or the mom bee as I call it where literally living in yoga pants and the same like yes. sweatshirt for two years and not putting on makeup or even earrings just I wasn't taking care of myself everything revolved around keeping this human alive and what was your can I ask what your that weight was then yeah. So that was like one of like my max, I was probably like somewhere between like in the 260 to 75 range. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, that was the, you know, that point where like, I got to that point where I didn't buy clothes that had sizes on it. Mm-hmm. It was like just big and stretchy. Like yeah. there weren't like, I was not fitting into pants with zippers and buttons. Um, and I just remember, yeah, like I just remember seeing the pictures and there was like this just, I was like, Whoa, like there was no waste you know, at all. Like I had always somewhat, even as in a size 16 and 18 had still maintained some, a way somewhat of an hourglass, but I was, there was no hourglass shape left at all on me. I'm five nine. So like I carry weight 
relatively well. I had always carried it relatively well and this was not okay. And I, and like my ankles hurt, like I couldn't walk like more than a mile without my ankle swelling or my knees hurting. Um, is that, was that the breaking, like, is that what motivated you to crawl out of this place was the physical pain or was it more mental or was it something else that kind of got it? It was too. everything. Yeah. It was everything. I mean, I definitely had some postpartum depression. Plus I had this skin condition that was just getting worse and it was very painful. And on top of that, I felt completely uncomfortable in my skin and just like exhausted all the time. And then, so we were living in a hotel in Hawaii because when you're military and you move, you like stay in a hotel for like three months while you find a house. And so I'm like in this hotel room with a new baby and a dog in a hotel in, a, in, in, a, in, in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, like on this military base, super isolated. And I don't have a car, so I can't go anywhere because my car hadn't shipped yet. And we had a little kitchenette in the hotel room. And I just remember like searching the internet for like, I need help. <laughs> like, what can I do to heal? Yeah, because you'd been going to these alternative practitioners and yet nobody had helped you up until this point. No one no. had said, maybe it's the food you're eating. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I did find a web a blog post on Rob Wolf's website by Tara Grant, who wrote The Hidden Plague. And it was someone who's who's like this woman who's like, I have this skin condition and this is called hydrogenized creativa. And I get it in these areas and food, I put it in remission through diet. And I was like, say what? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and then that moment I read that post and I was like, oh. <gasps> And she's talking, not, and she's like, okay, paleo. I'm like, I know what that is. I know if I did, did the paleo back in the day, you know? And then she's talking about nightshades. And I was like, what the hell are nightshades? And I was a chef, but we just don't talk about night. We don't talk about with the, their tomatoes. Right? Right. We, don't yeah. talk about them. we don't categorize <laughs> them like that, you know? And yeah, and that's when I really just went head first and out of that hotel room started dabbling, like going stricter on paleo. And it still took me, even after reading that post and, you know, talking about, getting to that point where it's worth it to commit. Mine wasn't overnight. I tried to gluten-free first, then strict paleo, then a whole 30. It took me four or five months of all that to finally commit to doing the autoimmune protocol because I wanted to see if I could get away with doing the minimum and getting better. And my body was like, of course, everybody does that. Everybody. And my body was like, no, not impressed. Nope. (laughs) No. And I think that that's really key for everybody to hear, which is for some people, I've had a ton of women that I can put them on paleo and their rash goes away. They're autoimmune. Everything just is like so amazing in 30 days. Yeah. And then there's people like you who that is just not the enough. extra mile and then some like the extra 25 miles and like, yeah. uh, and, like <laughs> and like a spaceship around the moon. Um, Cause you did was- autoimmune paleo, sorry, autoimmune paleo. And then you also did the specific carbohydrate diet, which is super strict. What yeah. do you think? Which one was like the, the ticket or all of them? Or what do you think? So what happened is that I did AIP and that got my, symptoms very reduced. So like maybe we should be clear about what that is actually. Right. So autoimmune protocol, you eliminate eggs, nuts. So it's paleo, but without eggs, nuts or seeds, seed-based spices. So like no cumin or like no black pepper, um, you know, just no fun things. No nightshade. So chili, paprika, you know, tomatoes, eggplant, white potato, Green peppers, um, no chocolate, peppers, no coffee, pepper. right? No kind of peppers. Um, it's really hard. It's a doozy. It's it's definitely tough. It tends to be very starchy in nature because yep. you rely a lot on starches for and like emulsifying things and fruit. And so I was doing that and I was feeling a little better, like a little bit, but I was still flaring. And I had some bloating. And it's incredible because the first, when I did AIP in the first three months, I lost 35 pounds. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it was inflammation. Like you were saying early on, it was inflammation just left my yeah. body. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. Um, and I mean, by no means was I counting calories or tracking anything. And I was eating all the carbs. I mean, yucca was like a food group for me at that yeah. point, <laughs> but it was just inflammation. But wow. then I kind of hit this wall and I wasn't finding remission and I was being so strict. Um, and I started having a lot of bloating and I was starting to correlate these starchier meals. Like mm-hmm. when I would do plantains or the yucca bread, I would make this like flatbread with these symptoms. So I was like, maybe it's the car, maybe it's like a SIBO thing. So I took, so I did specific carbohydrate diet and focused more on like butternut squash versus, you know, and that was, 
that did you go them. did you do like the, their protocol where you start no. with like boiled carrots okay no 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 okay i just did like i just omitted you know like more like the high fodmap stuff yeah. and just and the starchy things for my diet because i was already so like restricted at that point but um i got i got the list and just from the you know the internet and like <laughs> cut out the foods and i was like okay i'm gonna cut okay. these out and just took like the squashes essentially as my, my starchy source and i did that for a few months and I saw some improvement. Um, but then at that point, and still food and mood journal, I'm telling you people, food journals are life. I was keeping such a detail on everything I ate and my symptoms. And then I started correlating. I was only flaring on one place in one spot. And it was actually one under one, <laughs> under one boob. And I started correlating that flare with any time I had anything sweet. Uh-huh. and I like I nicknamed it my sugar boob because I'm like yeah. if I have sugar the, that, that like, I'd, yeah. <laughs> I'd get a little like a bump under my breast and I'm like oh and so that's when I start I was like okay I just got to cut out all the sugars and carbs and that's how I was like hashtag low carb paleo for a long time and like that's before keto even hit like right. it was a thing and, <laughs> and I whenever people talked about keto but I'd look I'd look it up and I'm like I that's a lot of cheese like I don't eat that and so I was like I'll just stay in my paleo corner but essentially that's what I did and so when I combined, so I reintroduced coffee, some nuts, I introduced chocolate, I reintroduced eggs. I wasn't able to reintroduce nightshades. Till this day, I can't reintroduce nightshades. Mm-hmm. I've yeah, so to- let's actually, let's clarify that for yeah. the listeners that once going on an autoimmune protocol or a specific carbohydrate diet, it is important to start bringing some stuff back in to see what you can tolerate. Cause most people, and you can attest to this too, probably Christina is working with so many people is that everybody's different as far as what they can tolerate. Some people can handle a green pepper and, but then they can't handle a potato. Some people can handle certain nuts and not others. I know I'm, I'm totally like that. It's just, there's, you're going to find certain things that are not on the auto that are, not AIP friendly right. that you can tolerate and then other ones that you can't. And then, and you can, sure. and it might change in six months, you might then suddenly be able to tolerate the potato. So it's going to change, but right. just so you guys know, it kind of gives people a little glimmer of hope. I think it does. it's not all out for good. No, and not just that it shouldn't be like, that's not like, it's not about living in restriction. It's about being able to heal your body and reintrodu- the reintroduction is where the magic happens because that's when you know definitively what foods are working for you and which ones aren't. Because yeah. the thing is that eliminating things and then you just, okay, maybe you feel better. And then people get a little scared to reintroduce foods, but what confidence to have in a food that you can reintroduce and not have any symptom and feel great and say, yes, this is a feel good food. I'm going to eat this all the time now. So like, I, I always say like, listen to your intuition. I knew, like I knew eggs were going to be okay. I just felt it in my bones. And so that's one of my first reintroductions, but like nightshades, because I had correlated, man, even before I knew about autoimmune protocol, I remember thinking when I, Jack was a little baby and I was in San Diego and I was in the middle of a huge flare and I had a fridge full of eggplant. I used to love eggplant. <laughs> and I was like, man, I wonder, is that egg? Could it be the eggplant, all the eggplant I'm eating? And I was like, no. But I remember, so I remember when I made that connection, I'm like, oh my God. Of all things, right? All things, right. Once again, it. like you think you're eating super healthy, you're eating the eggplant, and that is what was doing it to you. Right. So it is different. And even people with my skin condition will have different food triggers. So no one can do this for you. And again, people, and no, you just can't do a blood test for this stuff because no. the IgG and the IgE no. test, they're not testing. They're, they're not, it's, this isn't an allergy. No. This is an autoimmune response. So really the gold standard is just the elimination protocol. It really is. It yeah. really is. So what would you say now that you've been through this journey and you've worked with so many women, do you have like everybody should do it for three months. I've heard, I've heard very mixed reviews. Some people say it's four weeks, other people it's three months, other people it's a year. What do you, what, what's your opinion on how long do you do it before you start reintroducing? So I, if you're doing it on your own, like I did it, I think you need to do it until you start seeing an improvement. I started reintroducing foods before remission, but just seeing an improvement, like my flares were far further apart and shorter. So because if you wait till full remission, you'll be doing it forever. Like sometimes that's really hard, you know? Um, and then there's too many factors. Like you travel, you're stressed, right? If you're working with a practitioner or like a health coach, 
I think you, I think 30 to 40 days, maybe 60 days is enough because you're also going to be addressing other things like optimizing digestion. Like I was doing all this stuff and I didn't even consider because I didn't have the knowledge of my history of taking proton pump inhibitors. It's another mm, thing I took in my right. 20s. Yes. Years yeah. of antacids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. oh yeah. And like I had SIBO going on. I had all these things d- going on that I didn't know until I went to study nutrition for myself. And I was like, oh my God. So I kind of been playing whack-a-mole with symptoms and kind of stuck in this perpetual protocol phase, right? Because I wasn't addressing root cause issues. But right. once I did... And I had this clear idea of my trigger foods and I addressed SIBO and I addressed low stomach acid and, you know, other things I put into the fatty acid balance. And like, you know, I've been able to eat so many things that I could never eat before. Like I yeah. reintroduced, like I just, I was eating goat cheese last night, people like snacking on legit hard. It's like, it's really good. It's like goat cheese, Gouda. I would have never snacked on cheese like before because, oh my God, cheese will make me flare. But now I can eat some goat cheese, you know, have some butter every now and like I was able, I've been able to reintroduce a lot of nuts. I've been able to reintroduce just so many foods that otherwise would have caused a flare. So right. I have so much more freedom now. Because your um, gut has healed, correct? Yep. And I yep. continue to live a lifestyle that keeps my gut healthy. I, you know, I don't eat yep. crap. I don't eat processed foods. I don't take any like medications and I don't need, you know, well, I don't need to take any medications. Luckily if I had to, I would, but I don't, you know, we haven't, we haven't yeah. had, had the opportunity. Um, but again, even if I did, let's say I had to take antibiotics for something, God forbid, but I would know what to do to support my gut. And yes. I think that again, it's a lifestyle. It's not like, Oh my guts, my guts healthy. Let me go trash it all over again. Yeah. I was going to say, let's, let's talk about that too. Like people like you, people like me and other women that are extremely sensitive to foods, they have autoimmune condition, they've got, they've always had a sensitive gut. I would say it's not, it's pretty rare for somebody to heal their gut through autoimmune and doing everything that you're talking about and be able to go back and eat things like grains and beans and all of those things that you had to get rid of. I, I have never been able to go back and I can, I know that you haven't either. You've been able to put in some dairy, right? But right. really, could you ever go back to a, just a healthy diet? No, I mean, no, not regularly. I tried, no. I tried last summer, actually, I was in Miami and I was like, you know, I'm just going to like, maybe, <laughs> like, like maybe more rice, a little more beans because my mom was cooking these fava like, no. beans and some corn. And you know, what's crazy is that it didn't, I didn't get that inflamed. And I actually, because I was eating higher carb, I was crushing it at the gym. But like, I had like the really good, like I did like a rowing competition. I crushed it. However, I got so depressed. Oh yes. It okay. jacked up my mood so bad. And then I saw, it took like a, it took like a month later, even after I changed my diet. But then I saw the digestive stuff, like, you know, the bloat and stuff. And it took a little while to recover. So right. Like my body was resilient. So during, while I was actually eating it, it wasn't an immediate response, but it was a buildup. And I realized, you know, so maybe that, a little so, sushi. So then it would have caused inflammation right. and you didn't, maybe you weren't getting it so bad in your body, but the inflammation of the brain was triggered. And I think right. that's very key for some people to hear is when you reintroduce the foods, you may not get a bodily response, but you're going to get a, a mind response. If you eat something and you get depressed afterwards, that's a reaction. Like, yeah. or you get like super emotional. Angry. 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 Yeah. I've had people say, oh yeah, like, I don't know why it is when I get like, you know, like my pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks afterwards, I'm just so ragey. I'm like, stop, <laughs> hello, stop <me>. hello, <laughs> stop eating the ragey latte. <laughs> like it's the sugar, like your yeah. body's saying no. Um, yeah. So the yeah. emotional component, which is so interesting because I, you know, I've really, and we talked about this a little bit last time when you and I chatted, like, you know, intuitive eating movement and really trying to, I wanted to sit with myself and say, Christina, am I omitting these foods because I have to, or am I omitting them out of food fear? Let's Uh put this to the test. I wanted to truly try because I really had it in five years. And now I know with a certainty why I eat the way I eat because it's, it's what keeps me feeling good. <laughs> yes. Now in your book, you talk a lot about minerals. Mm-hmm. So we start with the food. We eliminate these high inflammatory foods, but there's more to it now. So let's build on that. So right. from that, you talk about 
minerals and the fatty acid balance. So can we get into that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's incredible how, and I like focusing on what you're adding to your diet is just as important, if not more important than what you're omitting from your diet. Which most people just omit. And then they're down to like eating the same thing every single day, all day long. Right. And it's, I felt, get I that fall into that. Yes. You yes. get that a lot. Yeah. You're repeating meals and they're running out of protocol. We've been eating the same thing every day for like, you know, two months. And I'm like, no, we need variety in our diet. And so interesting. So mineral and hydration is so important because something that's really overlooked. And I'm sure you say it with your clients all the time. And we can say it to the cows come home, drink enough water, drink enough water. But, you know, hydration is like a, a, a affects cognitive function constipation. It can make you feel fatigued, depressed, anxiety. I mean, even fibromyalgia. So you're really doing just as you drink water. You're like, I'm like, Oh, that's a good call. I'm going to drink some water. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's not just the water we're drinking. We need to make sure that we're absorbing it in our body and water is absorbed in our small intestine through osmosis and we need solutes. And so salt is not the enemy. And so using yeah. a good unrefined salt and then the minerals are so important for so many cofactors of enzymes in our body like so many functions in our body need minerals and so if you're eating colorful variety you know like leafy greens nuts and seeds um you're going to be getting like just different colored vegetables you'll be getting minerals like avocados sweet potato our good sardines oysters cheese uh you know pickled foods and so you'll you know you can get your minerals but electrolytes are also really important imagine electrolytes they conduce electricity and water and like literally we need that like for things to happen in our body like we're literally energy creating machines and so um a lot of people especially when they you know they go lower carb or even just if you're coming from standard american diet and you're cleaning up your diet and you're eating you're giving up the bread rolls the pasta the sandwiches you know you're going to be eating vegetables and inherently i don't care if you're eating sweet potato every meal you're still going to be eating less carbs than you were before yes and that insulin drop can have a diuretic effect and um and just you know for every gram of carb you your body retains three grams of water and so you're just not retaining as much water so you need more sodium and you need minerals you need more electrolytes so your body is using water effectively so you're not just peeing it all out yeah. Um, and that's just so important and not feeling like crap. Like yeah. I think sometimes we, really people, I'm tired, I'm fatigued. Or my skin, like the best skincare routine is being hydrated. Like yeah, before really you spend is. a ton of money on like all these creams, drink more water. So yeah. that's a big one that I often with clients, when you work with them, it's incredible things from fatigue, dizziness, nausea, um, just resolve with being conscious with water intake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just salt my water. I always yeah. have a little salt dish right next to my water and I just, I sprinkle it in there and that's know, such a great like, way to get it. And I know like the whole, the blood pressure thing is funny. Cause it's like blood pressure, believe me. I'm like, that's more like sodium potassium pump adrenals. Like don't worry about salt intake because I eat no. so much salt. Like I salt my food a ton. I add salt to my water. I add salt to my coffee, to my smoothies. Like, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I yeah. have low yeah. blood pressure. Yeah, same. Anything. I have low blood pressure. Very low. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. And then so fatty acid balance is probably something that I am obsessed about. I would say okay. like of all the things, it's my favorite because it has such an enormous impact, um, on everybody, whether you change nothing else about your diet, which, you know, I still think it's just a note of processed foods. If you focus on fatty acid balance, you're inherently going to choose whole foods. And also it's for me, the number one thing we can do to reduce inflammation. Okay. So what are fatty acids? So people understand what we're talking about. (laughs) So so essentially essential fatty acids in our body. So when I talk about fatty acids, I mean, there's a lot of them, there's like the triglycerides and all that, but we're talking about essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6. And they're essential because our body cannot make them. We have to consume them. Actually really fun to know, which I love is that minerals also same thing. We have to consume them and they come from the earth and like we get them in our food via the plants that absorb into the roots or the animals that we that eat them, like the grass. But like mineral ash, like when we die, like let's say if we're cremated or when things burn, what's left behind is the minerals. So minerals, like they're not destroyed. They're like returned to the earth. It's all very oh, interesting. Yeah. I know. I think, I think I it's like so that. cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so fatty acids, we have to consume them. And they're polyunsaturated fats, which are very delicate. They're not heat stable, right? No. And so the omega-6 and omega-3 create the, these prostaglandins, these different types of like hormone-like substances in our body 
that essentially are in charge of our inflammatory response. And everybody has to have a, it's, inflammation isn't the enemy, chronic inflammation is. We need a healthy inflammatory response. Like you get a cut and it gets a little red and swollen, that's your body trying to be like, oh, something's wrong here, let's inflame a little bit, like isolate it, right, protect your body. But then it goes down by itself because you're, you know, the omega-3, the prostaglandins made from that are gonna come and reduce the inflammation. So our body has these mechanisms to deal with inflammation, right? However, omega-6, are made from, are, are found in primarily, and in the American diet, in insane disproportionate amounts. They're in seed-based oils, which vegetable oils are not vegetable oils. They're made from the seeds. Canola oil, uh, grapeseed oil, soybean oil, corn oil, all those things are made from seeds, seed-based oils. And they're, first of all, the extraction process, the way that they're made, it's highly processed, there's chemicals, it's high heat. So yeah. they're already, before they're even hit your skillet, are already, like rancid. They're yeah. already bad. Horrible for you. Yeah. Horrible for you. They're in clear bottles. Yeah. Ugh. And so they're extremely inflammatory, not only because they're high in omega-6, the pro inflammatory, but because they're already carcinogenic because they're they're literally like they're they're rancid oils. And they're bad on us for you on a cellular level because guess what? We are made from the fats that we eat. Yeah. And so they're poison to our bodies. And you cannot eat out at a restaurant or buy any kind of packaged food without getting it's impossible. in impossible 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 kind of try and find a salad dressing that doesn't have it doesn't matter if it's organic if it's on the shelf and the refrigerator you cannot find them unless it's like paleo or whatever. unless it's primal kitchen yeah. unless it's primal <laughs> kitchen that's what i'm thinking in my head just only if it's primal kitchen <laughs> exactly oh my god they're the only ones who do avocado oil and so yeah it's incredible like when i was like omitted them and granted when i go out to eat at restaurants like people are like oh what do you, where do you go out to eat i'm like I used to love to go out to eat, but I rarely go out to eat anymore, mostly because of the oils. Like I'll get, I'll get sushi. Like honestly, I just go get sashimi because even when I go out to eat, I, I get headaches just from yeah. the oils that they cook. And, yeah. and so. And I've heard it like the, gums up your cells or something for like six months. Yeah. After it a, stays it's, in it's for ridiculous. a long time. Very Anything long time. that's, and they're frying. So like these oils that they say they have a high smoke point. No, screw the smoke point. It's a lie. And then it's just, they're so bad for you. And so the, so the, the oils that you should be cooking with are saturated fats and, and olive oil, which is a monounsaturated fat, but it's still safe. But then the, the hard thing is this, it's not just about omitting the omega-6 because other health, healthy foods also have them like whole food, nuts and seeds, which you can eat raw, even chicken, you know, like yeah. all foods have different ratios of polyunsaturated And we do fats. need the omega-6, just not need, in just this not crazy not amount of rancid oils. oils. Every single thing that we eat. And then the other issue is that omega-3, the anti-inflammatory prostaglandin, is really only found in some foods. So yes, grass-fed beef has a high, has a little better, like more favorable ratio, like pastured eggs. But if you want a concentrated dose, you got to eat seafood. And man, people don't like seafood, especially in the U.S. It's like salmon, sardines, oysters, mackerel, herring, the fatty fish. And people just aren't eating enough. No. Like they're not eating more than one, if anything, one serving a week, but it needs to be like two to three servings a week, you know, that people just don't eat it enough. Um, and really you can't get it. So like the seeds, like, oh, I can just see like hemp seeds or flax seeds. So the thing about the seed version of the omega-3s is that it's in the ALA version, which your body then has to convert to EPA and DHA and it doesn't do it well. There's only like a five, like a 20 to 5% conversion rate, depending on your body. So you can't really get it from the nuts and seeds, how they're like marketed. It yeah. has to really be like from the foods that have the already DHA and EPA and it's seafood. Um, and now, yeah, Christina, do you eat, yeah. do you eat a lot of that? I do. Okay. I actually eat, I, I eat a can of smoked oysters every week. Um, and I make seafood at least another two times. Um, and I also supplement with an omega th with an omega three. Okay. We're going to talk about that. Hmm. So I read Nora Gagadagas's book, mm -hmm. um, her last one, I can't remember, Primal Fuel. No, something like that. Anyways. And she stated in there, and I thought this was probably very true, was she won't eat it anymore. Anything that comes out of the Pacific Ocean ever since um, Fukushima. Fukushima. Yeah. Right. Because there is so toxic. So since then, I've been like, what do I do? And I've also done so much research on omega-3 supplements and how majority okay. are all rancid. 
Right. So I'm kind of like going, what do I do? Like, I feel like I so desperately need the omega-3s and I try and buy, like I've just, we had prawns last week and I got ones that were um, from, not from the Pacific Ocean. I can't remember where it was, but they weren't Pacific. Right. So I try to buy outside it, but that's right. really hard when you're it is. like, I live right like, next to the Pacific Ocean. Um, like canned wild caught al- elastic salmon, uh, al- um, Alas- not Alaskan, Pacific, uh, uh, Atlantic salmon. They sell it like canned at Whole Foods and it's um, pretty good. Um, I really liked like the smaller fish are also really good because they're also going to just have less levels of like mercury and everything else. So like sardines yes. are like hella good for you. Um, I like the wild planet ones. They have like lightly smoked packed in olive oil and lemon and they're pretty tasty. Um, and I make some little cakes out of them. The, I get the crown and prince um, smoked oysters and they're made um, and they're packed in olive oil. And those, if I'm not mistaken, are farmed, but in like, Vietnam or Thailand, but they're like, they're mollusks. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're not like, you know, like they're, they're like, they're little tiny. They're little, they're like, yeah, they're oysters. Like it's not, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think there's the same issue with like, right. Like you don't feed them anything. They're just like, they're in water and they grow. Right, right, right. I mean, people don't realize like oysters in general are like our farm. There's not like wild caught oysters isn't a thing. Um, and so I feel like, and those are a good option. Um, and just, yeah, do the best you can. I mean, I do still get some seafood from Alaska. I mean, when you think about like the salmon, um, the Alaskan salmon, you know, it's up there. <laughs> um, it yes, could be better. Yeah, I think it's probably um, is. But yeah, yeah I'd be tough. interested to know if there was anybody doing like research or testing on the fish right now. Like, I think coming out of Pacific Ocean, if we could um, find that out. There is a brand, what was their name? Safe Catch. I'm sure mm-hmm. do, I think does that. And I think they test every, everything they catch for different levels. I saw them on Shark Tank, but, um, the, and they do like delivery to your door kind of stuff. It's just expensive, right. but obviously yeah. worth it. Um, I also, and then again, I'm super picky with my omega-3 supplements. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, like I don't buy any of that stuff. Like don't get whatever's at the grocery store. And like, it's all, no, if it's Costco, on a shelf. Costco, Kirkland brand, ew, forget if it. If it's on a shelf, if it's on a shelf, don't get it. That stuff needs to be refrigerated. And so I really like, um, I like Myoscience, which is Mike Mutzel's brand. Um, and I really like the, the one from Biotics Research just because I really trust that brand. They're made like in Texas, so they're made locally. That they, They're my, by Omega-3. Um, and there was another one I really liked. That There's one out of Norway that I heard this girl talking about that was, but it's like Nor something. I can't remember what it's called. So. Okay. Yeah. But I would say if you can get it with cold and like something, right. actually a tip I learned from my friend Allie Miller is, um, a lot of times these places like you can always call them and see how they store it there. And like if they, some, some of them will ship it with an ice pack, but if not, what I've learned to do is I ship it in bulk in the winter. Ah, smart. So I'll buy like three bottles when it's cold out and then just put it in my fridge or yeah. freezer. Yeah. yeah. And that's something also that um, Dr. James and Nicole Antonio talks about a lot. Like he keeps his omega threes in the, in the freezer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good stuff to know because I'm, I know yeah. it's hard, I, but yeah, it's hard. And it's one of the things that we are ruining our oceans and people don't realize that it's this food source that's extremely essential. The reason human brains are like, are the way that they are and they're so big is because the, the, we consumed all these healthy fats that made our brains grow. Like when moms are pregnant, like that's the, they make you supplement with DHA because that's what makes your baby's grain grow. And it's like, we don't realize like it is a huge issue because we need seafood to thrive. Oh yeah. 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 We yeah. need those omegas. Cause even just for our brain health, like to combat Alzheimer's and dementia, mm-hmm. talk about skin health and anti-aging, like there's, it's so good for you. Right. So yeah. it is a very important piece to this puzzle. So right. um, I would like to jump into the fact that you did go from AIP to a lower carb ketogenic diet. Now, did you stay keto for a long period of time? I did. I did. Um, I mean, I did practice some carb ups, like carbs, a little bit of carb cycling, not a lot at the beginning, but um, yeah, it was almost three years where I I stayed predominantly keto. Um, And then it just stopped working for me to do it all the time. So now I do um, I don't know. I'm not tracking right now. I'm just eating whole foods and like some, yeah. some meals are keto, some meals are not, some days are more than others. I'm just following my body. Um, I think that low carb can be a wonderful overcorrection when you're over consuming carbohydrates for a long time. Like I definitely found myself in a more like insulin resistant type situation. Um, especially like after all those, I was baking a lot early on in my paleo days. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 
a lot. Uh, it's like, oh, I can make a cake with two cups of maple syrup. No yeah, problem. Yeah. It's paleo. <laughs> it's paleo. <laughs> um, but I realized that I reversed that. And then, um, yeah, I just started kind of listening to my body. And it's funny because a lot of people in the keto space ask me that right now because I still operate a lot in the keto space. Because a lot of the way, the way I cook is yeah. predominantly low carb because I like to prepare low carb meals and it's very easy to add some roasted sweet potato or, yes. you know what I'm saying? So it's easier to add carbs and take them away. Yes. If that makes sense. Yep. And so the way I cook in general is just very low carb paleo keto yeah. friendly. And the yeah. recipes in my book are because again, you can add, I rather than snack on some plantain chips fried in coconut oil, you know, um, dip them in some like, you know, whatever. Like I love pate. Like I love, I'm actually a weirdo. I love liver pate. And so I'm, you know, I'll snack on that versus having a meal that's like paleo pasta. Like I just wouldn't do that, you know? Right. I know. I like in your book, she says, if Jane and Joe were out hunting large game 40,000 years ago and stumbled upon a tree of ripe pears, do you think they would say pass? That doesn't fit into my macros. (laughs) I love it. But it's so true. But I, I think that that's an important piece. You and I talked about this when I was on your podcast is just that using keto as therapy as a as like a tool. Let's he, and a tool and you knew oh this isn't working for me anymore right and to really listen to that i think is so important for when when you're on this journey of healing your gut and healing your body to know when it's time to stop just because it worked for you at one time doesn't mean that that's your forever way to eat. And I know I've had to go in and out of autoimmune. I've done keto, I've done paleo. And it's just like, sometimes it's the time of year. Sometimes it's where my hormones are at. It's many different reasons. Totally. And I think it's interesting because I feel that we, we get like, I love how amazing keto can be to get people fat adapted. I think everyone should be fat adapted because where we like, but people then go too far and then they lose their insulin sensitivity. So we need to be in that middle where we're staying metabolically flexible. And I know you're big on that, like that, like, you know, like the, the, what do you, yeah. feast and, and fast Famine, kind of, yeah. you know, because we, we have to be able to burn fat and burn glucose effectively where I used to feel like when I was out of ketosis, like I was kicked off some Island and I had like a hangover and people are like, they're like, Oh, I'm out of ketosis. I feel horrible. And I'm like, you know, maybe at the beginning you're dealing with this, but you should get to the point where you're going seamlessly without skipping a beat. And I'm there yeah. where I can have fried plantains with dinner, wake up the next morning, have coffee with almond milk and ghee, go work out, run some errands. And then I'm like, Oh, next thing I know it's two o'clock. I haven't eaten yet, but I'm not like fainting just because my last meal was glucose heavy. No, my body's fine. It's burning fat. I've got storage. And then I can jump into a higher, like a lower carb day. And then the next day, and it, it really just goes with my needs. And so much of it has to do with my workout, how I'm sleeping, my stress level, my hormones, And having this flexibility is really where I think like what's going to make, what makes it doable for the long term. I think so too. Yeah. And that's the sweet spot. That's the the place that we all need to aim for. And you talk a lot about just getting rid of all these crazy food rules, right? And just doing what works for you right now and, and adapting as time goes on, but getting to that point where you're at right now. And you talk a lot about you know, knowing what foods are okay. Sometimes, you know, like you said, like you'll sometimes still go for sushi and that's okay. It doesn't set you back months, right? right? Doesn't have the, your sugar boob doesn't have an outbreak. No, it doesn't. (laughs) Exactly. But there, I'm sure there's other things that would do that to you. Right. right? Yeah. Like, like like I wouldn't do like, like even gluten-free pizza would be a no for me because, because it's regular cow milk, because it has tomato sauce, because there's a high possibility that that you know, has potato starch in it because a lot of gluten-free foods do. Yes. So I know my, you know, unless I, I went to a pizza place once and they're like, oh, we have a cauliflower crust that's like vegan and it doesn't. And I looked at the ingredients and it had no potato starch. And then I was like, can I just do it with olive oil and rose and veggies on top? And they, you know, so that was a worth it moment where I could, you know, I was like, cool, this is kind of awesome. I can eat out like sort of, and it was fine, but I didn't go back the next day or the next day. I haven't been back since. It was just like, this is a cool experience. Moving on. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and I'm obvious that I can, I can do the gluten-free pizza and I can't do sushi. It makes me feel so sick to eat white rice. Right. Everyone has their thing. No problem. I'm Cuban though. So it's like, I think very genetic, like white rice is like a staple in Latin cultures, you know? (laughs) And so like, I think that it's like one of those things that, but I did it for a long time. And it was interesting because 
that was a food that I omitted out of fear for a long time because we lived in Hawaii where again, they do a lot of white rice and I have this fabulous pressure cooker and I would buy this non-GMO sushi rice and make it with bone broth and some vinegar and like coconut oil. And I'll make it for my son and my husband that were really thriving with it in their diet and I just would never eat it. And then one day I was heating up leftovers. I'm like, oh, you know, I was reading that like, you know, reheated white rice is like resistant starch. I'm going to try some because I had just done like, like a 60 minute hit class. And I was like, you know, I was like, this is going to be great. And I was fine. And I digested it perfectly fine. White rice is fine for me. I still don't eat it every day. And there's yeah. a reason for that because of the emotional component of that food for me, it is a food that I will easily overindulge in. Mm-hmm. Like I love white rice. It's like childhood memories rushing back to me, slightly triggered from like my binge eating <laughs> days. So I, I know that like I can have it at sushi or have it like once every now and then at home, but it's not something that I'm going to include every day. And again, like I talked about earlier, I had that emotional response to continual to, to a lot of grains in my diet. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's key. So starting, if, if, if this is all, you know, sinking in right now and you're like, okay, this is me, this is how I'm going to do this, you know, starting with that, you know, if you haven't already start with paleo, you know, if that doesn't do the trick, move over to the autoimmune paleo. If you're still having gut problems, look for the root cause. Look for gut infections, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, parasites, candida. Get to the source of what, why you're still having digestive problems even after you've pulled out all these uh-huh. inflammatory That's foods. Yeah, and rebuilding yeah. from there, working with somebody that knows this stuff. What would you say to the person that, I mean, you're a chef, <laughs> <laughs> so to me, it's like, oh, you've got it so easy. You can make all this delicious food. A lot of people nowadays have a real struggle around just finding the time to cook. But when you do this, you really have to, don't you? You do. And yeah. that's kind of why I wrote my new book because yeah. it's called Made Simple for a reason. Um, all the recipes are one pot, sheet pan, pressure cooker, slow cooker. So they're really easy because you can throw some meatballs on a sheet pan, some broccoli and put it in the oven. I mean, there's a recipe in there for like a, 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 a salmon dish with vegetables that I think it cooks in 10 minutes, 10 minutes, literally. You broil salmon, it's done in minutes and you put them asparagus. Like, there are some things like you can put food on the table in under 30 minutes and it can be a from scratch meal. Just, and you know, some good seasonings or a good sauce and it makes it interesting. Um, yeah, and it's, Again, prioritizing, finding the time, because we make a million excuses of why we can't do things, but finding the time to make meals, whether that means meal prepping and eating it later on, or batch cooking, or whatever, has to be a priority. And that goes back to that self-care component, to that, that you're worth it component, that truly committing, because this is an important change for you you know, because it's not going to be easy. Nothing worth it in life is ever easy. No, no. You know? And it's a good point. And it's like, and people really, really want this, but they're not willing to cook. I'm like, you don't want it bad enough, you know? And I think that the same way that like making time to go to the gym, you don't find the time, you make the time. And that's the same thing with cooking, whether it means getting up half an hour early to put something in a slow cooker so you can have it later that night, you know? Yeah. Um, I always tell people it's like, you have to look at that like brushing your teeth. You don't ask yourself in the morning, do I feel like brushing my teeth? Oh, I really don't have time. I don't want to. Like you don't say that to yourself. So don't give yourself an option to cook or not to cook, right? To go out to eat, to not to go out to eat, to grab the macaroni and cheese instead of cooking. Just you, there is no option. Okay. This is what you have to do. So you just do it as soon as you start to sit, you know, oh, do I, oh, I'm so tired. Do I really want to coach it? Then you're in trouble. Right. Just, you just, just have to do go. it. But and she's simple. Yeah. And this recipe book is absolutely phenomenal. You guys, like I'm a big recipe person, so I love this, but they're all super easy, absolutely beautiful recipe, like beautiful pictures. Mm-hmm. I love them. Thank but you. there's like everything from salad dressings to, you know, the, like, like she said, one pot, one pan, as easy as it can Same. be. Some things are paleo, some are autoimmune paleo. So you've got a little bit of everything. And she's got this great forward in the beginning of the book that talks about hormones and protein and carbs and food is medicine and so many 
just little They're teachable awesome. things. It's so lot. great though. It's so nice Thank that it, it's not just a recipe right. book. You're going to learn from it too. All about what we've been talking about here today, about healing the body through food and other means. So, yeah. And helping you get to the root cause is a big one in that book, right? It's like, I talk a lot about like those things that help you optimize digestion and fatty acid balance and blood sugar regulation and a lot of conversations around feel good foods, worth it foods and hard no foods. Right. Um, yes, so yeah, 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 I, I, <laughs> I really wanted to, like everything we talked about today, I really put into that book and to give you the tools so you can figure it out for yourself and you're not living scared of food or, you know, feeling like it's, you, you know, you can't heal because I want everyone to know that they can get better. Like, yeah, totally. And without the food component, you will only get so far, just so you know. <laughs> doesn't matter how many supplements you take, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You can't do it without the food component. It's the base of everything. So that it's, it's made whole, made simple is the book, you guys. Um, it's Christina Kirk. You can find her at thecastawaykitchen.com. She has an amazing Instagram, like I told you before, become one of her 100,000 followers. <sighs> I'll get there one day. <laughs> you will. It, takes, it took me five years. Yeah. Uh, no, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was fantastic. Me. Thank you for having me.